I would like to start off in this presentation before I get to policy, just to give my own background of how big the challenge is. The problem, as you all know, is very clear. Our planet is warming. It's not really going to turn red, but metaphorically on my screen it is. And the reason is clear. The reason is absolutely because of emissions. That pie chart there is global emissions. It could just as easily be Australian emissions. There's small differences between advanced countries. But what you see is that three quarters or nearly three quarters of all of the emissions are due to the energy sector, the use of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas. So the simplest solution, of course, would just be to stop using energy. But that is completely impractical. If you think about the things that underpin our modern civilization, one of them, of course, is medicine. If you took away modern medicine, you're really only going back 150 years to the Enlightenment era before you'd be in a position where if you broke your leg, you might die because medicine was effectively so primitive compared to what it is now. If you took away modern education, you'd be going back to the medieval era, perhaps a thousand years ago. But if you take away the modern energy supply, you are literally back to the Stone Age. So just the prospect of dramatically reducing our energy need, it just doesn't exist. Things changed at the Industrial Revolution. 250 years ago, we went from just using wood or occasionally cow manure and peat to heat homes and get light and warmth at night to using coal for trains and machines to underpin the Industrial Revolution. That did not mean we stopped using wood for fires. We accumulated, we added coal into the mix. And then we added oil into the mix when free-flowing oil was discovered, I think in Philadelphia around about um, 1900, and now we've got much easier, cheaper, more convenient transport, but it didn't mean that coal went away. Coal just did different things, and the use of coal continued to grow whilst the use of oil continued to grow. Then in the 1950s, we started to develop natural gas fields for lighting, for heating, for electricity generation, and again, it just accumulated. We still had wooden fires, we still used coal, we still use oil, we still use natural gas. Now, of course, all of that was associated with massive CO2 emissions. And this time we have to do things differently. We can't just accumulate. This time we need to replace. And that's why we're looking at the most massive transformation in human, in human history. We need to replace those energy sources. We will use electricity for everything. Now, the chance of that happening without government guidance, without policy formation, is about as likely as nature producing a multicoloured zebra. The previous energy sources, coal came in because it was cheap and convenient at the time, and oil offered new flexibility to people, and same with natural gas, cleaner, safer source of energy. Governments did not need to push oil, coal and gas onto the population. But if it wasn't for government intervention 20 and 30 years ago and 10 years ago, we wouldn't have what we have today, which is cheap solar, cheap wind and electric cars about to become cheaper than petrol cars. So government policy is critically important. This is, in a sense, an unnatural transformation. Uh, I wrote a lot about this earlier this year in a, in a half a book called The Quarterly Essay, Getting to Zero. And I dedicated it to an architect, to Buckminster Fuller, for his phrase, to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Effectively, what he's saying is don't try and punish what's there. Just make it irrelevant by building something better. So we need a new model, an alternative to the existing reality. For Australia, if you look at the sectoral breakdown of emissions in Australia, this is our existing reality. And what you will see is that the emissions from electricity are the biggest stationary energy, that's buildings, heat and industry and transport, and then the future of emissions associated with our coal and uh, uh, gas exports. That's more than 80% of our emissions. That's the existing reality associated with fossil fuels that we have to replace with a new model. And the new model is clean electricity. And it's a three-step process. We need to first take our existing electricity system and decarbonise it. We're well underway, but a long way to go. 
We have to look at all those other uses of fossil fuels for industrial heating and building heating and hot water and cooking, and we have to convert them to run on electricity, clean electricity. And then step three is we have to take transport and completely transform it, whether it's heavy vehicles or light vehicles, to run on electricity or derivatives. Now, of course, you don't do that sequentially. You do all of this at the same time. But when it's finished, it's likely that we will be generating clean electricity equal to 300% of our existing Australian electricity requirements for domestic use. So a tripling of our electricity supply, and it all has to be clean. This new model in Australia, by example, we're growing. In 2015, we had 18 terawatt hours of solar and wind, and five years later, we had 46. So that's an increase, more than a doubling from 7% to 18% of total generation. Notice I don't have uh, hydro there. Hydro is about 6 or 7% of our total generation, but never changes. We haven't built a, a hydroelectric power station for about 50 years. In Australia, we have some bragging rights. We have the world's highest installed solar and solar generation per person, the highest in the world. And one of our states, South Australia, which is uh, just under 2 million people population, uh, in January of this year, for a while, for about an hour, was running on 100% solar. Quite remarkable. And that's challenging for the operators. So the new model in my world has the name, I call it the electric planet. That's where all of our primary energy is coming from electricity. Trouble is, even though electricity is like magic, it's incredibly convenient, it's not always exactly what you want. Sometimes you need a, a high density transportable fuel or you need a chemical, um, some molecules as feedstock for your industries. So enter stage left, the hero, hydrogen, hydrogen for if in some cases for heating our buildings and our hot water and cooking, hydrogen for industry such as steel making, but it could be ammonia making, hydrogen for transport and trains and trucks and ships. And in Australia's case, in a handful of countries, hydrogen as a new export opportunity. Now, the scale of that export opportunity actually is overwhelming. It's just huge. Hard to imagine, but let's give it a try. So come along with me and imagine a world where Australia is producing hydrogen for export that in energy terms is equivalent to our LNG, our liquefied natural gas exports last year. Now, last year we exported 78 million tonnes or megatons of LNG. Hydrogen is got a higher mass energy density. So to get the same energy equivalent, which is what the customers really want, uh, we have to produce about 33 million tonnes. That makes it sound easy, but it's actually very hard. We would need 2,250 terawatt hours of electricity. Some of you might have a, a gut feeling for whether that's a lot or a little, but to make it clearer for you, let me point out that that is eight times our current total Australian electricity generation. So it's an 800% increase on what we have today just to support that electricity industry. So it's quite huge. Can we in Australia build a global scale industry? Can the world sustain a global scale industry? Well, certainly from the Australian perspective, we're confident because we've done this kind of thing before, but it's different. It'll be hard, but we have confidence from experience. Um, the first offtake agreement for LNG exports was in 1979, took about 10 years before the first drop of LNG was exported and about 30 years of growth till we became uh, equal or a contender for the position of top exporter by tonnage in the world. So we feel we can do that again. And we have a, a, a proximity advantage. I'm putting up a circle there called the Valerie Pieris circle after the name of the guy who worked this out. And what's special about that circle is 50% of the global population lives inside that circle. And you can see from the Australian point of view, we have ex easy seaborne um, transport to the countries such as India, China, Korea and Japan um, that are our biggest trading partners and I believe will continue to be our large trading partners. But, you know, things aren't always as easy as they first seem. 
So a couple of challenges. Challenge number one, hydrogen is hydrogen is hydrogen. What I mean by that is there is no way that you can look at hydrogen that you as a customer might buy and know anything at all about its history. You can't work, you know, you can't work out the technology that was used or how much carbon dioxide was inadvertently emitted as a waste product during the production of that hydrogen. In other words, I'll put it to you this way, would you buy hydrogen from this man if you can't verify it? Well, I would buy it if there was a verification scheme. Now, one that has been tried is a colour scheme where you colour code the hydrogen, blue, green, purple, grey, brown, all sorts of colours, but they actually tell you almost nothing other than the technology that was used to make it. They don't actually tell you how much carbon dioxide was associated with the production of that hydrogen, and that's what's critically important. What we need to do is measure the emissions, the inadvertent waste product emissions during production. The, so that's the, the challenge and the requirement. The policy response is pretty clear, and we recommended it in the National Hydrogen Strategy back in 2019. We need an internationally agreed end-to-end, -end, I call it a well-to-gate certification scheme that gives you the numbers of kilograms of carbon dioxide associated with the kilograms yeah. of hydrogen you're buying. And the work is well advanced on this. Uh, just in um, this month, the International Partnership for Hydrogen in the Economy, the IPHE, which is a multinational uh, forum, been around for a long time, uh, issued this paper on a deep dive analysis of the methodologies that could be used to quantify these emissions. And Australia, alongside uh, France and the US is leading that uh, process development. The second challenge that worries me a lot is an imbalance between the supply and demand. Certainly in Australia, there's enormous interest in supply. It's not there yet, but it's poised and ready to switch on whenever the demand appears. So what are the demand opportunities? Well, one, of course, is using hydrogen for long duration storage and generation. Um, and that's one of the things that we will be developing domestically, but around the world, the same work has to take place. The other use of hydrogen that will build demand is heavy transport, be it trucks or ships or trains. Another one is industry, such as steel making or ammonia production, or just high temperature industrial heat for brick making in kilns, and the other opportunities are gas blending into the gas distribution network in cities and export. I won't go through all the examples, but these are the things that policymakers in their um, interactions with industry have to signal and in some cases invest in to smooth the way. The policy response in Australia is the Low Emissions Technology Investment Roadmap. Uh, the first instalment was put out last year and we've got one ready to go out, we hope, in the next few days or weeks. It's a principles-based framework. Um, we accept that Australia, the whole of the world, has to reduce emissions quickly, but we've got to do it without sacrificing our economic growth, our health, and our overall our prosperity. And there's a deeply held belief that the Minister has, the Prime Minister has, I have as chair of the panel that is um, helping the government to develop this roadmap, a belief that technology can deliver the solutions for all sectors of the economy. The vision statement in our roadmap is a prosperous Australia recognises a global low emissions technology leader. You can interpret that as we don't believe in the false dichotomy that you either reduce emissions or focus on growing your economy. We want both. Said famously recently by the phrase cake, have, eat. I love that capturing of having the benefits on both sides. So you're wondering to yourself who said it. Some of you probably think it was Yoda, but it wasn't. It was Boris Johnson at the Biden Leaders Summit. He captured that beautifully. Within our roadmap, we have priority technologies and stretch goals. There are five. Um, 
we, we, we chose these by initially looking at 140 different technologies and saying which ones have the biggest abatement potential, economic benefit for the country, build on Australia's advantages, and government support and intervention can help. Clean hydrogen, electricity storage, we've got to have storage to have a robust zero emissions electricity system. Zero emissions materials like aluminium and steel, carbon capture and storage, because we, at the end of the day, we're going to need to capture and store carbon dioxide out of the air either in the ground or in forests or in the soil. Each of those has a stretch goal. So we've got to find, I won't go through them, the famous one is H2 under two, but each of them has a stretch goal. So these are financial and duration targets. And collectively, those stretch goals, they add up to the big achievements that we're looking for. So we did the roadmap, last year we committed in that roadmap to produce a significant update every year because we're working in a world that's changing we have to be adaptive the roadmap 2021 it's, it's on the verge of being released so i've got coming soon then and there'll be a 2022 2023 there'll be one every year until we get to net zero so where does that leave us that leaves us in australia highly um well, we will achieve massive reductions through the adoption across the whole of the economy of solar electricity and wind electricity, a little bit of residual hydroelectricity and lots of hydrogen to support the use of the solar and the wind. What remains is the challenging area, very, very difficult. In Australia, a large component of that 20% remaining is uh, agriculture. But you know what, there are technological solutions for these too. And industry gets it. Industry in Australia, industry around the world, uh, in most cases supported by government policy, is investing. I wrote investment, not divestment. It's a big topic, but we're not going to get there simply by selling off oil and gas assets to some other company that is not in the public eye. We have to invest in the new zero emissions technologies. So go back to agriculture. That's a cow. Bos primogenius taurus. Next to it is a picture of some red algae, red algae, a common seaweed in temperate waters like Australian waters called Asparagopsis taxiformis. And it turns out, and the work's been done on this, that if you give the cows about 100 grams, small amount of this Asparagopsis per day, you can reduce their methane production because cows burp methane and so do sheep you can reduce their methane production by up to 90%. You can't get to zero, but that's a very small smelter in Australia. It's huge output. Uh, they, for 30 years, have been dependent on a sweetheart deal with a coal-fired generation station, but they've now committed that by the end of this decade, they're going to replace their coal contract with solar, wind and battery and pumped hydro electricity uh, so that they will be producing clean or zero emissions aluminium. Uh, Fortescue Mining, you'll hear from Andrew Forrest later on today, mine operations and the trains that take the iron ore to the port and the ships that take the iron ore to China or Korea or Japan or wherever it's going, all of that to be zero emissions operations. And on top of that, they're looking to become the world's biggest producer of green hydrogen. It's a clever strategy because they'll be a substantial user of green hydrogen, which will help them to, that, that's addressing the demand I was talking about before, and that will help them to scale up their green hydrogen and improve the economics. Um, when it comes to coal-fired electricity in Australia, it's, it's slowly reducing. There's no new investments. And what we're seeing is because industry with support of government is investing in solar and wind and firming through batteries it's becoming less economic for the coal-fired generators to continue and so one of our very big high emissions state, uh, coal plants uh, this year has announced that they're going to bring forward by four years their closure closure they've worked with the state government community so by bringing it forward they're going to get out of what will be a non-economic position in the long term. And by allowing seven years, they're providing certainty for the community to invest in new job opportunities. There'll always be a residual, so we will need sequestration. There's biosequestration, taking oxygen out of air through trees and other plant material, absorbing the carbon dioxide. 
or the same kind of thing in soil. But there's also what could be the knight in shining armour, it's too soon to say. There's also the opportunity to do what's called DAC, direct air capture, either through giant facilities with massive fans that bring air to absorption membranes, or what I'm showing you here is a startup concept that I hope will be proceeding quite soon of a standalone a unit that looks a bit like a pup tent that has solar panels on the side and it can bring air to a metal organic framework to absorb carbon dioxide and absorb up to two tons of carbon dioxide per year and the idea is you put not hundreds but tens of thousands or a million of these things into giant fields near sequestration sites collect up all the carbon dioxide and bury it essentially forever so technology is the delivery mechanism, but technology does not live in a vacuum. I'm a technology geek. I like the technology side of things, but it's clear to me, it's clear to everybody. You need the finance and investment. You need policy environment. You need public support. You need markets. You need lots of things to smooth the adoption and reduce the pain as we go through this enormous change to the way we produce and use energy. So. Our response in Australia is the technology roadmap supported by some long-term strategy that will be announced by the government in due course. But the reality is no country can do it alone. We certainly can't. And so one of the jobs that I've had for the government this year as the special advisor is to broker bilateral agreements with other countries on low emissions technology. And one of the big ones, really important, was a letter of intent that will, that will have funding associated with it. It was signed in July this year to look at collaboratively working uh, with industry partners in the UK and Australia with support through competitive processes by government to look at decarbonising heavy industry, using and producing clean hydrogen, a little bit of work on materials for small modular reactors and direct air capture and removal. The intention is to deliver practical in initiatives that will help both countries to reduce their emissions whilst enjoying economic growth. <music>